Hey everyone, I'm Mike Henry, and this is my Procreate demo for the piece I call Who's Next that I did with Renato Roldan. Those of you who have followed this channel for a while know that Renato did two previous guest demos where he did the entire piece. It's that Tifa piece where he merged Cyberpunk 2077 and Final Fantasy VII and the Mandalorian piece, uh, which you can see right here. Both of those are on the channel, so you can check those out. I'll link them in the description below. This was the first time that Renato and I decided to truly collaborate on a piece. We had done so in ways uh, professionally before because we used to work in the same studio, but now this was like something where just for fun we were going to throw down and do something together with him drawing and me painting. So that means Renato is going to start it off explaining his drawing, so go ahead and take it away, Renato. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so for this piece, I wanted to do a, a really tough girl, uh, a fighter. So I took some reference from boxers or, or sports people. Uh, I wanted to, to start with a really rough sketch and I tried to, to keep it loose. Uh, as I, I think the 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 more loose you have your strokes at the beginning, the the better feeling will have the character. So, if you see here, I'm not taking too much in account details or uh, even not the pose because I'm just trying to to get things in place and and like making a little bit of bonding boxes where the hips are, where the the chest is. And then I move into the next stage. I, I repeat this method a lot. And I know some of you have been surprised that I do the sketch so many times, but for me, it's a way of, of removing things. It's like when you, well, I, I try to think about it when the old sculptors had a huge block of marble and, and they start digging and they start to, to carve and remove pieces. So for me, this is a little bit similar. I, I, I try to to start as chunky as I can, and then I start removing things, moving uh, this here, the, the other thing there. So I try to, to, to find the character that I'm trying to, to, to get. So in, in this case, you're, you can see that I'm adding a little bit more, uh, more details and 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 starting to to define a little bit more where the boundaries of the character is. I base these these characters in in some images that I found in in internet about uh, fighting girls that are really tough. They have um, big uh, shoulders and and I also inspired a little bit on the outfits that they are wearing. Um, I didn't think at all in terms of color or whatever because I know that Mike was going to have that part so it was a relief to just think on the look of the character in terms of line and, and shapes. Uh, he will deal with that later so up to you man. <laughs> and then I go to, to the inking part. Uh, and lots of you have asked me what kind of brush that I use, and I always use the same, even for sketching. Um, well, I, I'm changing a little bit now because I'm I'm using Merced the Cardinist uh, for sketching because it gives me a little bit more of that flow uh, in terms of, of the strokes that I do. But for inking, I always, always, always um, use uh, dry ink uh, on Procreate. It works super well for me. I know some of you have asked me that if I have uh, custom settings and I do. Um, I'm not sure if you can check them out now, but uh, if you go to my stories, I have a dedicated stories to the settings of dry ink. So check him out if you are interested. If not, I can assure you that the one that comes from by default in Procreate is so good because I, I use it too. So don't be worried about uh, special settings. What is already in Procreate is good. 
So as I said here, I'm just trying to get the limits of the character, giving a little bit more of volume in some parts with the line, uh, making it a little bit more detailed. And that's basically it. This was a really, really, really fast uh, drawing that I did. And as you can see by the end of result is super amazing, but mostly it's because my colors are awesome. And so this is Renato's final liner. I didn't know what I was going to get. We left it completely open. And uh, when I got this, I was like, oh, this is super cool. Now, what can I do with it to try and like take the interesting elements that Renato has and go further with it? Um, that was kind of the mindset that I was in. And in addition to that, I was kind of leveraging Renato to get a little bit out of an artistic funk. So part of it was also like, okay, I don't want to come up with any ideas. I just want to do the painting part. So let's see what I can do here. So since Renato totally killed it, I had to bring my A game while I was in an artistic funk so it was a little bit interesting but I'm really happy where this ended up so let's start talking about it I thought it was kind of fun just throwing a layer and right now I take over just so it was kind of like this fun little oh this is where I received the file you could see real quick there a bunch of layers turning on and off that was me just kind of looking at what he already had uh, in the file and just cleaning it up this is a new file by the way I took his and duplicated it and then cleaned up some of the layers and moved on from there now that's not something that I would have done if this was like a Photoshop file, but since every layer counts in Procreate, I had to get rid of any kind of working uh, layers that he had uh, in his file. That's what you saw there. So now I just instantly jump in with loud colors. My thought process on this was, okay, we've got this cool character. This could easily go a little bit more of like a naturalistic route as far as color choice goes, but let's try and do something like really punchy and crazy with it. Um, and maybe this was also a little bit lingering of I've been missing doing those uh, monster pieces because the colors were always so fun to do there. So I was like, okay, well, let's not... Let's let's try and embrace the same mentality there and just go like really big and bold with the colors So right off the bat I set the background to my favorite color and then I was like Let's just see what's going to play well with that I think you're gonna see what appears to be a fairly singularly minded or I should say uh, Goal oriented mind when it comes to the colors that I'm choosing here But I will admit that there's well, you're gonna see some tweaking. That's just normal uh, But I was I thought about it a lot before I started doing this I didn't do any kind of color tests uh, uh, you'll see the adjustments that if I have to make them, I'll make them in real time. But I sort of thought a lot about it before I dug in. I believe Renato gave this to me. And I, I think it took me like a day before I actually got to it. And so I was just kind of, you know, in the back of your mind, you're always kind of lightly solving problems. It's like a good way to kind of like put something to the back on the, on the low burner, so to speak. Um, and so that's kind of what I was doing before I dove in. Uh, if you're new to this channel, uh, I haven't been putting out videos super regularly, so it's probably worth doing a little bit of a recap here anyways for those who have stuck around. Uh, this is painted with my new turpentine brush that I made at the beginning of the year. Uh, previous year, I fell in love with the turpentine brush in Procreate, but I wanted to do some new things with it, so I made a new one. Uh, all the brushes that you see me use in here are either included in Procreate or they're part of my brush set, which is free and small. It's just a little brush set and it's linked in the description. Um, so go ahead and check that out if you want. From that set, the main thing that I'm using here is the new turpentine brush. That's what I use to lay all of these flats. That's also what I'll use for all of the rendering. Now, what am I choosing here when I'm choosing these colors? I've got her skin set to this blue, um, which is obviously, you know, people don't have that skin color. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find sort of like reasonable analogs to like what you already might expect certain articles of clothing uh, to have. So for instance, I still go with like a bluish purple because she's kind of wearing like blue jeans. And then with her eyes, which isn't clothing, but it still relates, I still go with like white. I could have gone with a crazier color just to, you know, be crazy. Uh, but there's certain expectations I feel that the viewer has. And once you're already playing with a lot of uh, really strong colors, really strong choices, it's good to like try to have like some rest in there. I think that this piece as a whole doesn't actually have a lot of visual rest as far as intensity goes. I'm still controlling where the eye is going a little bit and I'm doing like the color blocking that I think is going to work really well for it, uh, but that is all with very, very intense colors. So trying to like minimize how much of that I'm going to put on the viewer is still something that's floating around in the back of my mind. 
eagle-eyed viewers, or maybe not so eagle-eyed, um, but people who remember what this piece looks like can see already that I'm working with this bright yellow and her jacket that she's kind of got wrapped around her is not yellow in the final. Uh, I'm a sucker for like pink and yellow together. I think the two colors just are really, if you're going for something intense, it's a really good combo. Um, so I wanted to do that. However, I very quickly realized just how distracting that was going to be with such a giant field of yellow. Um, obviously I'm also in the middle of still doing the flats and I didn't have the color scheme like color keyed ahead of time or something like that or some sort of a loose block out. So I'm in a bit of an experimental phase right here. Um, already you can see with what I'm laying down right now, I knew that I wanted to make her like bra top thing the same color as the background just so that there was that kind of fun flattening happening there um but that's kind of the only thing that i think was really a spur of the moment decision that like truly stuck while i was in the middle of doing it sometimes people ask how i choose my colors i will admit that part of it is instinct i don't have a whole lot of science behind it there's some science involved in the sense that i do understand color theory and i do leverage certain rules sometimes but i don't necessarily like go on like a website that you know there's websites that like build palettes for you or like you could build a palette before you go in and say i'm gonna work with this palette i think that's super cool and fun um i just don't really ever do that i instead usually go in with some ideas some very 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 loose ideas and then while i'm in there i reconcile it as i go so for instance i could easily see this piece done in like a number of different palettes and i think sometimes the push and pull of the colors is actually what's more interesting than going in with a plan at least for me so for instance with this one you could see that I kind of put that stake in the ground at the beginning that she was gonna have blue skin and then I was like well then that means I'll do like purple pants that means I'll do this yellow jacket that means I'll do this pink like sports bra type thing um, and like as I'm going I'm recognizing what each color that I'm adding is doing to the composition and then I'm adjusting from there these are all very high chroma colors so there's a lot of balance that kind of has to be done at the same time though that was understood. I knew that I wanted this thing to be really intense color-wise, so I'm not backing off of it. Instead, I'm just trying to find the harmony where I can. So I put this kind of green sea foam, like just intense green hair in, and I really like the color play of that hair, but I don't like, like you can already see right now that it's just, I don't know, there's kind of a lot going on right now. Uh, not that there isn't in the final, but I decide that needs to be toned down, but I do like the way that that green looked. So in a second here, you're gonna see me switch the jacket from yellow to that same green. I'm throwing in the eyebrows just so I can get those landmarks in because the more and more flats you get in, the more and more anchors you have to what you're doing and you really truly see what you're working with. In fact, you could argue that these colors could all be any colors just to get your flats in and then you can go through and start adjusting them or refilling them as you choose so that you can try to find that harmony so now i'm putting these uh like bandages in and i just put them in as white because you know that's fairly logical that they'd be white i like the idea of them being solid and without shadow uh similar to the way the sports bra is but i do end up uh, applying just like a little bit of shadowing to them uh, because I didn't want them to, I wanted them to still turn form. I wanted it to still feel like there was dimension to the whole thing. So uh, you'll see that they get made yellow though because I really liked the way that yellow worked. So I wanna bring that yellow back in right there. They just got switched to yellow. So now what I'm really liking about this, let's talk about the palette for a second. Uh, her hair, her skin, her pants, her top, her gloves are all in the same analogous section of the wheel. Then we've got this green that's a little bit of a jump and this yellow that's a bit of a jump. So what we essentially have here is a tetradic color scheme. Now we do have the blue in the skin which kind of starts pulling a little bit too much um, sort of like away from the wheel uh, or excuse me I should say away from the like purple pink that we're dealing with in the tetradic scheme but I consider the blue skin in this to be actually more of a neutral. It's kind of like how in fashion you can consider like a Metallica neutral. I guess you could kind of see it as the same thing. So while I got here by sort of pushing and pulling and kind of feeling out where I was going to go, um, where I ended up landing was something that is more or less just like a true color scheme. So that's sort of what I'm talking about when I say that I, I kind of blend actual color theory with just instinct and trying to feel it out. So can I... Can I just call out what should be done with an illustration? Yeah, sure, sometimes I can do that. Um, but when I'm doing something like this where it's exploratory, I feel, 
I mean, I kind of feel like, why bother? Why not instead just go in and experiment and have fun? Maybe you don't end up on sort of like a classic color scheme. Maybe you end up on something that's like new and fresh, or maybe you end up on something that's a little discordant and it feels kind of weird, but you like that it feels weird. So I think sometimes uh, it's good to just kind of go in, have fun, feel it out, and see where you end up. So as I was saying though, we ended up on a tetradic color scheme. Let's talk about this really briefly. Basically we're talking about taking two analogous colors on one side of the wheel and two analogous colors on the other side of the wheel. And that is our scheme. There's lots of other schemes. You can actually just Google uh, the color schemes and you'll see like sort of tried and true ones and you can play with those It's a really good way to learn how to build color uh, But this is kind of what we fell backwards into here with the colors that we chose now there is wiggle room I don't want you to think that it's like plug in these RGB values and stick to these RGB values You still want to adjust things uh, play with value things like that But this gets you like in the ballpark I would say and then you can start playing with it after that so that's what we're dealing with in this piece is this type of a color scheme, although some colors represented much more than others. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's go ahead and finish up the rest of our color scheme. You're seeing I'm throwing in these like metal uh, cuff pieces. Uh, that I would view as a neutral, although I did think about what kind of gray that it is. It's a bit of a green gray. And then we're going to bring that same metal into the buckle and her belt is going to be the same color as her bandages so that we can get a little bit more of that part of the color scheme in there. Now again, I didn't think of it that rigidly. You can look at this piece now and say that it's essentially a tetradic color scheme, but that isn't like when I was in the middle of it, I wasn't like, oh, this is tetradic, so I need to get some more yellow in here. It was more just the feeling of, I like that yellow pop, what color is the belt going to be? What makes sense for it to be? Um, I think that if we were going to pick another color that was already in the illustration, uh, probably the purple from her gloves would be okay, but we would certainly lose a little bit of the punch. Because there's the whole part of the character design that's about color blocking this well and controlling the eye and making sure that we're focusing on the upper half of the character. But there's also the side of just like a bright yellow belt's kind of cool. So let's give her a bright yellow belt. What does she look like from like the uh, thighs down? Does she have yellow shoes? Maybe. Is, it, is she a character that we're going to want to show like a badass kick like frequently? Maybe we do want those shoes to be bright yellow. Who knows? But I don't have to answer that question right now, so we're not going to. So her eyes are also going to be made yellow. I feel like that just kind of ties things together. I'm usually against what I would describe as an asteroid belt color scheme which is or color blocking which is when you have lots of little pops of lots of different types of color all across the character and you don't really know where you're supposed to look however i felt since yellow is essentially the little accent in this color scheme that we needed just a little bit more of that in there i think that the last kind of component to the color scheme when you're talking about an illustration is also what you're going to be doing with your values and your lighting and all of that. And since right now we're just dealing with the flats, it's pretty easy to see that like this yellow is kind of dotted all over, but we are going to bring a lot of focus with our lighting. So that's how we're going to get a little bit more of it kind of pulled upwards as opposed to jumping around all that yellow. Also, the yellow is competing with some pretty serious colors here. So, you know, it's not that distracting. It's not like she's all gray and then she has lots of yellow darting across her. What you saw a second there, for a second there I should say, was me saying like, okay, I'm going to do some cast lighting across her, uh, so let's establish some shadows that are being cast. Uh, then I'm also going in and putting some of the uh, like color shifting on the skin. Uh, even though this girl is blue skinned, I still want to have what we've talked about, we've talked about that in the past on this channel, is the idea of representing skin and all the variations across the skin and how much life that actually brings to something. Uh, so what you're seeing now is I wanted to get the flats around and get the like oomph of the flats around so that I could see if this is really what I wanted to do. And then I saved out the flats and just sent them to Renato just for like a fun like, hey dude, it's in progress, like what do you think? And he was all like, dude, cool, or whatever. And then we, we moved on from there. So now we are past all of that. We are past the flatting stage. That doesn't mean that the flats won't get tweaked, but now we are on to the form shadow ambient occlusion stage. Uh, if you are unfamiliar with my layer setup, essentially every one of these flats that you see and with some uh, careful engineering for separation purposes, all of these flats are on their own layer. Then on, they're all in a folder 
and then on top of that is a separate folder that's going to have all of the lighting components. Uh, the lighting in this case is a super saturated purple. It's like a, I shouldn't say super saturated, it's like 50% saturation, if I remember correctly, uh, but it's certainly sitting up in the high values and then that layer is set to multiply and all of our shadow layers are going to be set to multiply because multiply darkens. The closer to black, the more opaque it is, the closer to white, the more transparent it is. And then all of the colors that you choose in between those two values of zero to 100 in terms of um, value are going to add whatever qualities they have. So if it's a little purple, it's gonna bring a little purple into it. That's how Multiply works. I've actually done a breakdown on Multiply in the past. I think if you search my channel or search YouTube and type like Zetransis and then like Multiply, you'll probably find it. At this point, there's kind of a lot of videos and I would say I've done a medium job of like naming and curating everything. Let's call it medium. Um, so yeah, that's that's where that is. If you, you, you can go find that. So to recap, flats are all separate. Each bit is separate. Uh, something like, for instance, her forearm and finger skin, that's, on, that's the, the hand that's wiping the face, is on a separate layer than the face, and the face is on a separate layer than the body. Um, those are probably the only aspects that are really broken up here. There's a little bit with the, the coat, but that's, that's it. Otherwise, everything kind of gets its own layer. Now, you may have noticed that the uh, gloves got shifted, but they got shifted within palette. So whenever, when I was monkeying around with that and I was just kind of like sliding some things around trying to find, I didn't like the fact that it was sitting in the purple range because so was her hair. I wanted it to kind of stand apart from her skin and her hair so I, and, and her pants because her fist uh, overlaps, her, her left fist overlaps, overlaps with her pants. Sometimes talking is hard. And um, I needed to shift it away from that. But what did I shift it to? I shifted it to a green. It's in the same palette as the jacket. It's just way lower in value. So we're maintaining our color scheme, but we are getting it, um, we're, we're still finding that separation that we're looking for. Because when you're doing these color palettes and you're trying to solve all of these problems, there are so many things that you have to take into account. Things like readability, consistency, uh, the fact whether or not they clash. Clashing is kind of like a generic statement, but I think you get what I'm saying. So you wanna find something that's still within that, ra within that realm, but still get you the goals that you're looking for as an illustration. Now, the thing that would be another curveball that could be thrown at you if you were doing character design would be something like, here's the character, here's her line art, but in the story, it's important that her gloves are red. And to be honest, at that point, that's what you have to start with. And then you kind of build your palette from there because that's the immovable color. In this case though, I'm just having fun, doing whatever I want. So they end up getting the green treatment. So all of the flats in their own folder, then there's another folder that has lighting. The lighting in this case is going to be essentially kind of like everything that's affecting the flats underneath. So as I mentioned, there's the shadow layers. The shadow layers are all done with a multiply. Then we're going to start applying some light layers, additional shadow layers, some glint stuff, some shine stuff, like all these kind of like little tricks that are going to go on top of the flats and they augment the flats. We are using almost all different type of blend modes because blend modes impact the flats that are under, the, well anything that's underneath them, it doesn't have to be like flats, but it impacts everything that's underneath them. Uh, the only thing that I would say that I'm pretty sure is the only thing that doesn't get a unique blend mode is when I actually do like lighting. I don't want to say highlights, but let's just say a step above midtone. Um, those are just set to normal, but they have a reduced opacity on them. So now we've moved on to the face. You can see as I'm going through here, by the way, there's some shadowing that's getting applied and then it's kind of overlapping with other pieces. Like you can see on the forearm, some of the coat shadows are overlapping. That's because I'm overpainting. I'm, I'm using a selection on the thing that I want to paint and I'm painting that. And even though my paint might go outside and overlap with something else, eventually I'll get to the next flat and I can select that f flat and clear away the shadows and then reselect it and keep painting there. Um, that is the method that I call select paint, select clear, which is linked down below. There's like a breakdown of kind of how that works. Uh, hopefully that will explain it a little bit further. This is my way of, I, I use this method actually in Photoshop as well, but it's particularly useful in Procreate because you have to limit how many layers you're using. And if you're somebody like me who uses a lot, a lot, a lot of layers, this is a good way to try and 
get all of that control that you're looking for from having lots of layers, but doing it in a, a more economic way. Uh, and so that method is not something that I invented recently, but it's something that I would say in Q2 of last year, Q2 of 2019, is when I was just kind of doubling down on I'm sick of doing sort of like color picked painting and always running up against layer limits. So this is the best way I think to do this. I've actually used this method since like 2007, 2008, something like that um, on various pieces when I'm going for certain looks and feels. Um, it, it works out really well for like animated stuff um, or if you're going for like I mean, to be totally honest, I used to only really use it for animated stuff. And then over time, I started adapting it to how it might look for something to look more painterly and rendered. And then that's what eventually led me to in 2019 saying, this is the way I'm going to do things when I work in Procreate. It's not the only way I work in Procreate, but it is, I think at this point, safe to say that it is the absolute most efficient way for me to get the look that I'm going for and maintain the layer economy that I'm looking for. So the actual technique, like the hand and pencil technique that's going on here, as opposed to talking about some of the technical settings and all that kind of stuff that's happening here, is uh, what, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm putting down the paint with the turpentine brush and I'm kind of placing it where I want it to strategically go. But I know that what I'm going to do is I'm going to end up using the smudge tool also with the turpentine brush to kind of smudge around and get some of the softness that you're looking at here. This is a way for me to use the same brush so that I've got consistency on erasing, painting, and smudging. I'm using the exact same brush and I'm going through and I'm getting this soft look because in a second we're going to start laying down some of the hard cast shadows and that's going to be done by just laying it down. There's going to be almost no smudging. The only time I might use smudging is if I'm trying to kind of round off a certain uh, like rounded off around a form or something like that. You can see there that all my layers just got turned back on so you can start seeing this thing coming to life a little bit more. Just with all of those variations in there it starts feeling, things start feeling a little bit more real. Uh, here are the hard shadows now. Oh, one thing that I should comment on I just noticed because the lines are turned back on. You can see that the collarbone that Renato originally drew and the collarbone that I painted are a little bit different. Uh, this is actually no fault of Renato's as far as the anatomy is concerned. This is something that happens to me when I'm drawing too. Sometimes when you're dealing with an entirely 2D thing and you're still thinking about the form but you're just kind of like, you know, there's different solutions because you're dealing with just line and there's so much that's like the gaps are getting filled in that then when you take something into the rendered stage and you're actually trying to solve the anatomy kind of in different ways you're actually saying like okay i can't just go with a blank open white area here there has to be a collarbone that's connecting to this deltoid that i'm rendering or like you can even see where her pec pectoral overlaps with her bicep um the original drawing had it kind of the other way around because there's a different thought process that happens and then when i come in to do the rendering it's like oh whoop hold on we gotta kind of correct that and the exact same thing happens when i'm coloring my own stuff there's times where i am getting away with it in 2D with the with a line drawing and then when I have to make it quote unquote like real it ends up becoming something I can't ma maintain and I have to go in and actually correct it so that's kind of what's happening there I mean you can even see right there I quickly went in and I added a little bit of her trapezius and then started to add like a little bit of a cast from that because I was like oh I didn't even account for that when I was in there doing it so that's a big like bridge that's a big gap to bridge, there we go, that's what I'm looking for, uh, is going from that line art into the painting. And I, I should mention, I didn't mention this earlier, I have a lot of experience doing this because earlier in my career when I was working in games and I was a concept artist, for fun what I would do is I would color people's lines all the time. Part of it was for practice, and part of it was for exposure. The idea of just, hey, so this, this talented artist put up lines, reach out to them, see if it's okay, and then do my own color pass on it. And the thing that's awesome about that is sometimes those people share what you've done, which is great, and it gets you some exposure, but it also allows you to get like kind of like in their head and you start understanding like certain decisions that they made and you start understanding also some resourcefulness around, hey, this was drawn this certain way, like how am I now going to render that so that I'm still upholding what the original line said uh, in, in a paint. And I think that there's a lot of flavors of that. There's like, 
Do you want to just color somebody's line arts and do like flats and some gradients? Cool. Do you want to color somebody's line art and do some like more rendery stuff, but it's still supporting the lines? That's cool. Do you want to completely take over the lines and eventually end up with the lines gone and kind of see what you have at the end there? That's also cool. And so like by, by having, by coloring somebody else's artwork, you get to take away all of the thinking around what it's going to be and you get to focus only on the coloring and the rendering and all that and on top of that as an additional thing you also can learn from them and and learn not even from them but learn new things because of what you're trying to do what where you're trying to take their art which is which is just awesome so i used to do this a ton like i want to say like 2000 five to 2010 give or take um and then i i got kind of too busy to like do it on a regular basis but it was always really really cool and really really fun to do and that's kind of what i'm like reliving doing this piece here with renato it's something that he drew i had no say in what he was drawing and then he gave it to me and then i got to kind of have fun with it and try to think the way he thinks and introduce some new things into the way he thinks and and that kind of like conversation that happens between um the line artist and the colorist is really fun so that's that was this was just actually like a blast to do i, I really had a lot of fun doing this at the time i didn't want to think about what things were going to be um so yeah i'm gonna uh, show up about that real quick though because i just saw the lines flick on and flick off and i want to start talking about this i don't know what renato thought i was going to do but what i decided to do while i was in the middle of all of this was i wanted to end up with something that didn't have his lines on it not because his lines were great but because i wanted to try and take his line work to a place that i do because i just thought that that could be interesting but what's something that i do every now and then is i I add the lines back in after I've rendered it. So what I started to do at this point was, hey, are there really cool opportunities here for me to bring some of the lines back in and punch up some of these forms? Because even though I think this, the rendering for this comes out quite nice, I think that it's really kind of a cool stylistic thing to bring in some of those lines, especially when you have an artist like Renato who has such a line driven style a lot of the time. It's not the only thing he does, but it's certainly a, a thing he does. And so I wanted to say like, hey, is there a way that like, to continue that conversation between the painter and the the colors I should say and the line artist as can I bring that line back in in some way on my end to try and like strengthen the entire thing and do something cool so that's what you're going to see happening now across the piece it starts with some scratches like like on her shoulder and then it goes into some of the anatomy reinforcement that was already in the original line drawing and I'm bringing some of that back in it's got some of these like outline components so at this point, I've rendered this thing and I've done um, what I kind of wanted to do there. And I'm trying to see if there's more panache in a way that I can bring uh, to this illustration. And speaking of panache, I just want to make some quick highlights here. You can see that I brought in this texture into the shadows, this dot matrix texture. I thought it'd be cool to kind of bring some of this uh, stylistic element in, this patterns. Um, also the rim light that I used and the line that I used for some of the details is very similar to what Renato used in his original drawing. So I'm trying to do my best to be really conscious of different ways that I can affect this and bring like different vibe to it uh, as well as honor and respect what Renato did. You can see that the rim light has the same brush that Renato used and then we're doing a really really subtle outline. You can see that on her leg right there. Instead of doing like a big outline that's even around the entire thing, I decided to do a really thin subtle one that I think punches her a little bit forward uh, and gives a uh, but it's, it's not too much. It doesn't feel heavy. So let's go ahead and bring this illustration the rest of the way home. There are some tweaks that are darting across uh, the whole thing. They're actually too small for me to really like zoom on and see, but this is 1080p on YouTube. So hopefully you can see everything uh, clearly or maybe not, I don't know. All I know is that there's more of the time-lapse. So maybe together we will go on this adventure together and see what else changes. Uh, the last thing that I want to say on this is just this was fun. I had a lot of fun doing this I think that this piece came out nice And I think that it's it's usually kind of gauche for the person who uh, did who participated in it to say that it came out nice But I'm just really happy with the way it came out. I think Renato did a killer job and uh, I think that uh, the way that we kind of like merged at the end ended up being uh, really fun uh, What you're seeing flicker on and off there is that like dot matrix uh, texture getting thrown in. I put Renato's signature in the bottom left. I put my signature in the bottom left. I'm putting in some of these like last minute tweaks just to make sure that everything is where it needs to be. 
uh, toying with a noise filter on the background, toggling some things, probably saving some stuff out for Instagram, and then here is the final version of the illustration. Now let's just go ahead and take a look at the lines and then transition back to the final. Huge thank you to Renato for doing the lines. Uh, what a killer character. I would love to see more of her. It pulled me out of my funk. And thank you for watching. Thank you for sticking around. I know it's been a little quiet around here, but I'm super happy to be getting these videos out. So I'll catch you on the next one. And if you're looking to find Renato on the internet, these are some places where you can find him. And if you're looking to find me on the internet, these are some places where you can find me. Thanks everyone. <laughs>